What's going on everyone? We're gonna do something a little bit different this time. We did a video probably six months ago where we went over bad financial advice on TikTok. And I basically pitched it to Jerry and Michael and then we kind of talked about each piece. We're gonna kind of do that, but uh, more of a reacts video. I'm gonna show these guys five videos that I either found on TikTok or that were sent to me uh, so that we can break them down and kind of go over if they're true or not. So let's start with you, Mikey. Okay. All right, here's the first video. I write my children checks. So my children have earned income. I bet you never knew this, but you can pay your children up to $12,000 per year. And you can write it off as a business expense, which takes $12,000 away from your taxable income. And since your child is only getting $12,000, they don't have to pay any taxes on that money. So you're basically getting $12,000 off your taxable income and your child's getting untaxable money. You would already know this if you followed Alerts Capital. So this video was going full blown viral. So many people uh, sent me this asking, is this real? So Michael. Oh boy. <laughs> Everybody's always trying to find some sort of tax loophole. They are. Uh, I said it, I think in the time at the video that we did the TikTok piece is that uh, the IRS is not stupid. And uh, to the extent that we try to find ways around the system, they've gone through the very same thought process. Uh, with respect to this specific video, being able to hire your kids and pay them $12,000 so they have $12,000 of earned income, I mean, there may be a degree of truth to that, but the amount of complications that it comes with are uh, very real and something that every parent and slash employer needs to consider. I mean, first of all, you have to put your child, you have to officially hire them as an employee, you have to go through kind of the payroll issue as, as, as an employer. Uh, I don't know that the, necessarily that the earned income for the child uh, is tax free necessarily. I mean, kitty tax, I think has, what's the limit on kitty tax now? Do you know? I don't actually know the limits on that. Uh, let me try to think what else I want to push back on this video with. I'm trying to think what else could be, could be out there. What are you thinking, Jer? What I would say is pay your taxes, okay? You know, I mean, if, I, uh, I want to pay the taxes I owe. I don't want to pay more than that, but I also don't want to do anything questionable uh, or unethical to avoid it. And so, you know, with something like this, uh, I would say if you are uh, actually hiring your child to do a job and you're paying them, great, you know, but paying them per uh, solely for the purpose of avoiding taxes, uh, first of all, you do run a risk because, you know, if it looks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And the IRS does have the ability to look at that and say, okay, you're paying your kid, he's on payroll, great. What's he do? You know, and if you don't have a good answer for that, uh, you know, you're potentially being you know, hit not only with the taxes, but with tax penalties uh, for trying to evade the, your taxes. I, I mean, just realistically speaking, think about it. You know, if the IRS comes and says, you know, uh, your daughter who's seven years old gets paid $12,000 a month, what does she do for, for the year. company? Sorry, $12,000 a year. What does she do for the company? And unless she's performing work that warrants that price point in the eyes of the IRS, they're going to ask some questions about it and likely take action against you because, again, they're not stupid. They know that you're finding a way to manipulate the system. So, so if you have a clothing brand for toddlers, you could hire your child as a model and shoot the child and that technically could be uh could classify that right could work. but the idea and this is what i, I kind of gathered from it that even if you don't have a business you should just go spit up an llc so that you could pay your kid to avoid the taxes that's where you're starting to get into sketchy i sketchy mean town. you know like i bring my son to work sometimes and he sits there and you know, he's writing stuff on the whiteboard, or he's playing on his iPad, or I have him maybe, you know, go throughout the, if I, I'm gonna try to pay him $12,000 now a year for, you know, doing that, uh, well, one, I wouldn't feel right about it. Uh, and two, uh, I give the IRS a little bit more credit than that. Fair. All right, next video, and this one's going straight to Jer. He is gonna love this one. <laughs> All right, Jer, hit the, the play on that guy. This is the new number one side hustle. It's called Tax Liens. You want to go on your county tax website, search up Tax Liens, and get a list of people who haven't paid their taxes on their property. You can pay that tax for them and get a tax certificate. 
they have a grace period to pay you back. And if they don't pay you back, you keep their property or their house. So that basically means you can get a $100,000 house for 200 bucks. The other week, I got a $35,000 house for $600. Okay. Uh, it's true. You know, uh, tax liens are a real thing. Uh, I would say that the... I mean, he, he touched on some of the problems with it, namely that you're going to pay the tax and they have the right to buy the property back from you. And the interest rate uh, that they have to pay isn't always very attractive. Uh, the big risk you run into is particularly in uh, your more desirable areas. Sometimes, you know, the, the, when the tax lien is sold, it's sold at an auction. And so people will come in and buy these tax liens uh, and they're competitive. You know, it's, this isn't an unknown, you know, area. And so, uh, you know, let's say, you know, out here, if I wanted to buy a tax lien, I might be paying more uh, than what the actual tax is uh, on the property. So I run a risk that uh, if that property owner does redeem uh, the property, I might actually take a loss. So it's not risk-free, uh, and the interest rate if the uh, uh, buyer or excuse me the property owner does pay you off maybe zero or negative uh, and um, you know so but he's absolutely right if you happen to get lucky enough to find a property that you would want to own uh, and that person for some reason doesn't redeem the taxes yeah you have the ability to foreclose on that and, and own the property see you took that in a totally different direction than what at least when i first viewed it and when i first viewed it uh as he was saying that i was like how he's saying it makes it sound like everyone can go swoop up a hundred thousand dollar home for two hundred dollars right it just seemed too easy you know uh, which i'm glad you touched on uh the fact that you don't always get those kind of, what do you call it, diamonds in the rough? Well, and yeah. if They're I'm hard to find. There's a lot of people looking for them. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, I think you were right in that typically these things go to auction. It's not like you could just access the website and pay it off and you're done with it, right? Yeah, if you're buying the tax lien, uh, they're always sold at auction. Yeah. So, uh, and it's a public auction. So, you, you know, you, anyone can go in there and bid, provided that you demonstrate that you have the cash uh, to actually, you know, uh, pay out or purchase the lien. Uh, but particularly for your larger properties uh, in more desirable neighborhoods, uh, it's a public auction. There's a lot of people that, that bid on them. So perhaps the part he's leaving out is that he attended the auction for this, the 600 or so dollars he used to pay, buy this one property. And in fact, him putting it out on TikTok is actually hurting him because now he's driving more people to these auctions and he's just created competition for himself. Maybe. But maybe he's just that good of a person. You know, you wanted to help everybody out. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're in a rural area and you know, you know, uh, you know that you're in a place where there's not a lot of institutional attention, uh, or um, you know, circumstances like that maybe have better opportunities than than uh, places like Southern California. But uh, the other thing, you know, I mean, remember when you become a property owner, you not only get the benefits, you get all the downside too. You know, so know what you're buying. It's possible, you know, for a you know property to trade for a hundred dollars and that might be too much you know so uh, be real careful to you know do your due diligence know if there's any kind of environmental liabilities know if there are safety issues you know it, it may end up costing you a whole lot more that's See, a good the point. interior of it by itself like i think a lot of these things are typically sight unseen yeah so you don't have a chance to actually go in and inspect the unit i mean you may be buying it for six hundred dollars but it may require tens of thousands of dollars to go through a renovation process just to bring it up to code or to get it into a position where you could actually turn around and sell it. So uh, buyer beware. It's interesting that you just said a hundred dollars might be too much. Yeah, sometimes yeah, it is. You don't think that's right. All right, this one, this one's gonna, this one's gonna be a good one. All right, hit play on that one. For me or for Jerry? Now, Jerry, this is gonna be good for both of you guys. I don't own a debit card. I've never owned one. I've never allowed my three sons to possess one. Certainly and truly the worst financial tool ever given to the American consumer. So a long time ago, I asked myself a simple question. How would I remove 99.9% .9 of my personal liability like that? So I use the safest form of payment that exists on the face of the earth, and that is a credit card. Credit card. Not debit credit, but credit card. 
Every day of my life, I spend their money. I don't spend my money. My money sits in a money market account, it earns interest. If I pay the bill in full or part of the bill, my credit score goes up. So I'm building credit while I'm using that credit card. If tomorrow someone gets my card number and charges one million dollars on my credit card by federal law, my liability is zero. I have no liability. You want me to start? Uh, He's a wordsmith, kind of. <laughs> He's really good with how he presents the words. Okay, there are, there, there are truths in what he said, uh, starting with the liability. Typically, I mean, and by now with you know, the rise of identity theft, most of us have experienced some degree of credit card fraud. And in the vast majority, if not all the cases, typically when you are not the one authorizing a transaction on your credit card, you're not responsible for having to pay that bill. So there is a degree of liability protection that's there. I'm not quite sure if the limits that he references uh, are accurate or not, but I know myself, my car was once broken into. They charged, I think, about 10,000 bucks on you know, a few of my different credit cards. I wasn't liable for any of it. Uh, so there is a degree of truth to that with respect to the liability protection. Uh, I don't know and I don't believe that the debit card gives you the same degree of protection. It's probably not as easy having to negotiate with the bank. I think you have to complete certain affidavits, whereas with the credit card company, it's really just, hey, I'm disputing this charge because I didn't, wasn't the one that authorized it. So I think it's a little bit easier uh, with the credit card. In terms of building the credit or not using my money because I'm using somebody else's money, you're using your money because you have an obligation to pay that. Whether you pay it in full at the end of that month or whether you pay it over a period of time, at the end of the day, you're going to pay. And you're likely going to pay more than what the item would have cost you had you paid with cash if you're spreading out the payments over a period of time because credit card companies do really well and it's not by accident. The interest rates that they charge are pretty significant and you will pay, you know, if you buy a $100 item at 18% interest and you're paying it back over a 24 month period, you're gonna pay more than the $100 that it would have cost you had you paid up front. And so, um, while I agree with some aspects of it, I think the basic fundamentals of finance still apply. Don't spend more than what you're capable of spending. Have good financial disciplines. You earn income, you save it, you put it aside for retirement, you invest in a Roth or IRA or a traditional IRA, and then with excess capital, once you've allocated your money for your mandatory expenses, if you have money left over, that's the money you can use to go out and spend whatever it is that you want to spend on. Don't spend more than whatever that allocation is. Just because you have a credit card with a $10,000 limit that's saying, hey, come use me, you know, here's 10 grand waiting for it, it is a way to entice you to outspend what you earn, and that's, in, that's a, definitely an area where you want to avoid, and I don't know what you'd add to that, but. Yeah, I would, I would say the exact same thing. Uh, you know, the, the liability protection, uh, for, particularly for fraudulent charges, is a benefit. Uh, you do have similar benefits with your, your bank. Uh, for consumer accounts, uh, you would have, I think it's 60 days to dispute any kind of a charge uh, that you know, someone made against your bank account. Um, but the downside is you might have a situation where you know, if anyone still writes checks, not everyone does it anymore, but you know, if you're writing checks on your bank account and also you know, somebody gets your debit card, you might have a problem with you know, checks bouncing for a time. So there's a convenience factor uh, for the credit card, but like Mike said, you know it's a good tool. But uh, you know they, uh, the credit card companies know that when you pull that plastic out, there's a propensity to overspend, yeah. and uh, and that's a big risk. And so you know generally, you know for people who don't find themselves in that problem where they're very disciplined about paying off their credit card balance in full every month, um, yeah, I would say that's good advice. But uh, for the person who maybe has a tendency to, you know, spend now, pay later, uh, I would say you're better off avoiding credit cards at all costs. I, I mean, the buy now, pay later is such a cultural phenomenon in our society today, right? I mean, everything we see is, I, even your paycheck, it's go spend your money of, of your paycheck before you actually get your paycheck. Yeah, right. You know, this concept of credit and utilizing credit is so prominent in today's society. It's, very easy to buy into that because you think, okay, yeah, I'll eventually get paid and eventually I'll pay it back. The amount of money that you spend in interest over the course of a lifetime for somebody that subscribes to that opinion, uh, that excess capital that went to interest that they could have then used to instead invest, 
uh, could have dynamically changed their financial position long term. A hundred percent. Yeah, and really, the, the only thing I didn't like that he said is that I use other people's money, not my own. That was the one part I didn't like. It's not true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. This one is this one's over my head. This one I feel like Jerry's going to have to break down. Probably. All right. All right, Jer. Let's go over this one. Legendary investor and billionaire Ray Dalio says in late 2021, quote, everything's going to be a problem. Here's why and here's what he said to do in his latest Bloomberg interview. He says that everything we're seeing right now are the signs of the classic end of a long-term debt cycle. He said that either interest rates rise and the stock market can crash, or they buy bonds to lower interest rates but also accelerates inflation and the devaluation of the dollar. He said late this year, you're probably going to see, quote, everything be a problem. He said that the big risk would be monetary inflation, which could lead to stagflation, which is the worst parts of deflation and inflation. It's when you have depressed GDP growth and inflation at the same time. And here's what he said to do. He said he wouldn't touch 10-year bonds with a 10-foot pole. Cash is trash. And that you need to have currency, country, and asset class diversification. Like and follow for more. Okay. Okay, so um, that first sounds of all, like Ray Dalio. It does. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've read his books. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I'm going to say first of all, uh, Ray Dalio is brilliant. Okay, he knows what he's talking about, and uh, and I think that that was a uh, uh, reasonably accurate uh, summary of of what he wrote. Uh, there's. Uh, 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 Dalio wrote a, a, a series on uh, uh, big debt crises. He's a student of, of the subject and uh, talks about um, sort of throughout history, you know, as companies go through, or excuse me, countries go through this credit cycle, uh, you know, and how it, you know, works out both for, uh, you know, small, you know, emerging market type countries and, and you know, larger economies like the U.S. Uh, fascinating read, um, really technical, but uh, you know, very valuable uh, to, to actually read. So um, what I would say in response uh, is not disagreement, but timing matters. Okay, so you know, when he talks about you know, all this is going to happen in 2021, no one knows that. Uh, and in fact, there's, a, I would say, a high probability uh, well, we talked uh, about our inflation, you know, outlook and, and concerns uh, here a month or so ago, and um, you know, I made the point that I think that the uh, Federal Reserve's outlook is uh, likely accurate. Okay, and uh, certainly that's our, you know, what we refer to as our base case or most probable scenario. Um, but uh, there's a there's a high risk that uh, maybe it doesn't work out that way, and maybe a high inflation, stagflation type environment like what he's hap what he's talking about could happen. Um, ultimately, uh, Dalio is probably right. We probably do end up in a scenario where there's some economic pain as we unwind, uh, you know, the the debt uh, expansion that we've been experiencing. Uh, whether that comes in the form of inflation, currency devaluation, those two kind of run hand in hand, uh, or higher interest rates uh, causing you know, economic growth to uh, go into the tank. Uh, some combination of that is likely to be an issue uh, in the future. But is that next year or is that 20 years from now? Uh, no one ought to have high confidence in you know, the timing on that. Uh, those, this kind of a debt cycle can run for a very, very long time, particularly in the case of a large economy uh, like the United States where all of our debt is denominated in local currency, where we do have a very strong uh, economic engine. Uh, so you know, it, it can run for a long time. Could be end of this year, but it could be 20 years from now. So what do we do with that? And you know, a lot of the times when we hear people talking like that, uh, we hear them, you know, encouraging you know behaviors or investment behaviors to capitalize on this, you know, uh, inevitable outcome. Um, that can be really destructive to your wealth. Uh, you know, when you are investing, you want to invest for the base case. Okay, what's our most probable outcome? That's where we're likely going to be making money. Everything else is probably going to detract from our wealth. 
Uh, so if we're looking forward and saying, okay, chances are the Federal Reserve is right, chances are inflation is temporary, chances are we're going to go through another few economic cycles at least before uh, the debt burden starts to become a real issue, uh, well, that's a problem we don't want to be positioning for today because uh, if I am avoiding investments and, you know, uh, or you know, specifically, you know, focusing investments on things that would benefit from that. Well, those uh, are from the you know ultimate demise uh, scenario. Well, those are probably going to suffer until that happens. So we might have a little bit of those things in there just in case, kind of like an, an insurance policy. Uh, you know, insurance structurally is something you expect you're going to lose money on. You don't go out and buy life insurance thinking that, or you shouldn't go out and buy life insurance thinking that's going to be a source of profit. That's uh, preventing economic, you know, suffering for your family should the worst happen. Uh, you're, you're trying, you're taking an expected loss to prevent a risk you can't afford to take. Okay, that's, that's the right place for insurance. Uh, when we're talking about things like this, I uh, kind of take the same perspective. You know, am I going to buy some gold? Am I going to buy uh, some, you know, maybe foreign currency to, you know, hedge these risks? Uh, these are things that are likely going to cost you in the short run, but should the worst happen, they provide a, uh, a benefit. So keep those in context. You know, uh, don't go, uh, don't fall to the temptation to go, you know, headlong into the hedge because more than likely you're going to lose money on that. Uh, but to have a little bit of it, like an insurance policy, does make sense. I mean, even in the video, towards the end, he gets to what Dalio's uh, uh, recommendations are, and those recommendations hold true almost no matter what situation you're in. You know, diversify yourself, different asset classes, having exposure to international. Uh, is the right way to go. And so I think what I take away from seeing that is, is there a potential of what he's saying will happen to happen? I think it's quite possible that there is. Will it change my investment philosophy and how I approach how my dollars are deployed? Not at all. I came up with a very systematic approach. Yeah. I put in you know, X percent I want to keep as cash for opportunity so that when things go down, I have some money available to be able to buy. I have you know, X percent in stocks and bonds and in real estate. And if that fluctuates because the market fluctuates, that dictates whether I buy or whether I sell. It's not, you know, market conditions and, you know, uh, speculation of what may happen in the market that's going to make me change. It's my allocation was designed custom to me. And if there's movement in my percentages in each one of my asset classes, that will drive my decision making. Not, uh, you know, not, you know, uh, what's what's the phrase that they use? Uh, um, uh, impending doom, so to speak. Yeah. Well I, would, I would say when, whether it's Ray Dalio or, or any other, you know, uh, you know, high profile figure, um, there's a lot of nuance to what they say. And I, you know, so if you just take a snippet like this guy did and start trying to make decisions based on that, you can go really far away from what they were intending to communicate. And so uh, be real careful with that. But, uh, you, know, you know, I think Delio is right on. I think he's, his uh, advice is solid. Just be mindful of proportions. Well said. Okay, I hope that helped kind of break down some of these videos, especially the last one with Dalio. Uh, let me know what you thought of this video. If you like these videos, we'll do more like this because seeing stuff like this all the time. Uh, and also, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit the like button, it gets these videos out, and we get to make an impact on more people's lives. So we appreciate you, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>